Good morning and Merry Christmas. So grateful we can say that now. Hope you all have some joy in this place today, no matter what you might have carried in with you. We have joy because Jesus has come to us. He's redeemed us and he saved us and he set us free. So let's celebrate that together today as we worship him. Come on. I'm so grateful to be able to say Merry Christmas. Finally, we're here in this season. I don't think we could get here soon enough in 2020. And as, as excited as we might be to get to 2021, I don't want us to miss out on what God has for us in this Christmas season, amen. Do you want all that God has for you this morning? What Advent means, what Jesus coming to this world means, we celebrate that today. And we get a chance to celebrate even more this morning 
as over 20 people in our services today are gonna get baptized. We celebrate that. So as they do, as you see this on the screens, man, cheer it up for them this morning. Shout out, uh, give them some shout out, give them some love as they do that. We know that baptism doesn't save us, but it's a huge step in following Jesus and trusting him, professing our faith in him publicly, going all in, pledging allegiance to him. So it's a big deal, we wanna celebrate that. And there's a specific story this morning that we wanted to highlight to you. You're gonna see it on the screens in just a minute. We want you to check it out. It's a powerful story of life transformation. So buckle up and check this out. Growing up in the um, inner city, um, I came from a family that we're mostly a, uh, atheist, Buddhist. Um, I really never knew who God was or anything. I was raised in and out of foster care, um, different family members, and um, never knew who my dad was. Then my grandma got custody of me and I ended up um, moving to California, the Los Angeles area. I drifted off into the gang life. Um, I felt love and protection there. I started reaching out to the wrong people Things happened at home to where I ran away and I was talking to people on Facebook that was from the neighborhood that I was from, not knowing that I was getting lured into a situation where I ended up coming human trafficked. My gang sold me to my first trafficker. So I ended up um, being trafficked up to 10 years and Right around the time when I started getting into God, I was in and out of jail for getting caught in prostitution cases. There were women that would come in out in the area that I worked in, South Central, would come do outreach ministry, and they ended up um, praying for me one night, and I was like, wow. And they gave me a little Bible, and I just started reading more into it, and then I started getting into it like, dang, everything that I was looking for and been looking for since I was a young girl was, it was Jesus Christ. So I remember reading the scripture where God um, says like, um, I could prove to you that I'm real, test test me. And um, I did. And um, I remember my trafficker beating me one night and going to drown me in the bathtub. And I prayed and he dropped me and threw me in the room and locked the door. And I remember picking up my little orange Bible saying, God, you really are real. Like, I want you to help me out of this. The next day when we had to go back to work and I just remember coming so angry with this rush and this feeling like, I just remember they had a gun in the, in the drawer and I was gonna kill him to escape. I just remember getting into the hallway and I just remember these chains breaking off of me and I always used to call them and I still do invisible chains. And I just felt this force stop me in the middle of the hallway and it was like forgiveness and I'm free. Like the devil worked to him to mirror what my heart really desired as a child. And I forgave him and I left him, I got help from the women that prayed. I called the 1-800 human trafficking line and they came and they saved me and I never seen him ever since. I decided to help a young minor out of there that was sold from back and forth from different traffickers. And I wanted to give thanks now that I'm in a safe environment and um, I have a child that I get a second chance at life and Restoration House has helped me do this. And I just thank God for saving me because he called me out of darkness into light. And one day I hope that I can help save girls out of this lifestyle. The reason why I want to get baptized is to honor him, to thank him for, for saving me, to giving me a hope and everything. Jeremiah 29, 11 is my favorite verse and he's living up to it. And I have to thank God for everything that he's done for me. Be 
death could not hold him. This morning, that's so important. It's what we witnessed in these baptisms today. Because of his resurrection, we're free. We're free from sin. So let's sing this together this morning. Celebrate the greatness of who he is. Do you believe in the powerful name of Jesus this morning? We're so thankful to be in this place. So glad you're here. Why don't you have a seat? I want to welcome those of you online. We're so glad that you're here this morning from all over the world. We're, we're thankful for those of you in this place. I love that song we just sang. Oh, what a miracle. That once I was dead, now I'm alive. Death ain't all that great. Life, pretty amazing. And I'm grateful this morning as we get to celebrate and kick off this Christmas season that we serve a God who has given us life. So thanks for being here this morning and braving the uh, incredibly horrible weather that we're having. This is so weird. I'm from California. This is normal. This is like amazing in, in, in Missouri at this time of year. So, hey, we're glad that you're here. I hope that you find this place to be a place that when you walk into it, that you experience Jesus. You know, all of us have a next step in this, in this journey. And today you got to see some who came in front of you to say, I'm gonna follow Jesus with everything that I have. And maybe you've got a next step that you're, you're, you're contemplating, that you've not done yet. Maybe it is baptism. We would love to walk you through that. And in the seat back in front of you is a card that's called a Next Steps card. And we'd like to invite you to, to fill that out. If you, if, if you need baptism, maybe you want to be discipled, maybe you need to be part of a group, and that's your next step. Let us know that. We, we'd love to help you. If you're online, livingproof.co slash next steps. You here in the room can do that as well. That's where you fill out a card, and we will come alongside you 
and help you journey with Jesus. It's hard to believe that in just a few weeks we're going to be celebrating Christmas Eve, which is probably pretty good because I think 2020 can kind of go away. And we're going we're gonna to focus Christmas Eve on celebrating the miracle of Jesus' birth. And we want to invite you to be part of that. We want to encourage you, though, uh, in order to make the space available for those people uh, that need to be here, we want to encourage you to register online. So if you go to livingproof.co slash Christmas, you can register for a spot. There's going to be five services starting at noon. We'll be streaming those services as well for those of you online, but we would encourage you to reserve a seat so we have a great day. You know, we, uh, we say all of the time in this place that worship is all of me for all of him, and it's the state of surrender that we have in our lives towards Christ. And another way that we do that in our, in our times of worship is that we come before him and we give because he's asked us to do that and to be generous so that we can reach the world for Jesus. And we want to give you an opportunity here and online to do that right now. So there are three ways that you can give. You can, you can go to our website and give online. You can text to give. You can also fill out a check and put an envelope, mail it in, or drop it in these baskets as you, as you leave today. But hey, let, let's join together this morning in prayer and ask him to bless this moment of surrender. Lord, we come before you today because you are a God who is incredible. Some of us know that in a really acute way this morning. And Father, this morning I pray as people are in this room and then online that, Lord, you would speak to people and you would move in their hearts and you would show them the hope that is in you. That we wouldn't miss out the beauty of this time of year because 2020 has been so hard, but that we would understand the hope Jesus brought to the world brings to our lives as we, as we follow hard after you. Father, I pray that right now that you would use this, this moment, this, these funds that people will give to you out of complete surrender. Lord, that it would reach a community and a lost people that need to know you, that need to know what it looks like to move from death to life. And I pray that you would use these funds to further that so that your kingdom would grow you would change us in the process. Father, we love you. We're excited for this season. We're excited that there is hope and that there is joy. I pray that you would, you would allow that to just uh, bubble up in us and, and that, Lord, it would be expressed in new ways this year as we share the hope in Jesus. God, we love you. We praise you. And it's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So glad you guys are here. Good morning, Lee Summit. Good morning, Blue Springs. All of you watching online, we're about to begin a new series, Stars, because we're going to follow the star the wise men followed 2,000 years ago when they found the Son of God. You know, this is the year that many stars have died. If you watch the news, they usually go through kind of a iconic hall of fame of stars in our culture that have died this year. And 2020 actually is a year where many have died. And all of these were real icons of our nation, icons of our generation. All of them were stars in some capacity, rock stars, movie stars, uh, media stars. Uh, all of you will remember, of course, Kobe Bryant, who went down tragically in a helicopter crash back in January. Kobe Bryant was the first high school basketball player to skip the college game and go right into the NBA. I mean, you talk about a star. 41 years of age, he died. 
Of course, uh, you'll remember, because it was all over the news for so long, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a star, of course, of the U.S. justice system, chief justice of the United States Supreme Court, passed away recently, just a few months ago. Uh, you may not know who this is, but if you're a child of the 80s like I am, <laughs> you know who this is, because it didn't get any bigger as Eddie Van Halen. And Eddie Van Halen passed away, of course, a few weeks ago, 65 years of age, so young. Amen? Yes? I told my wife when it made the news, it's like it's kind of weird to watch our teenage stars begin to get old and die. And that's what we're watching now. Eddie Van Halen, one of them. And of course, Alex Trebek, every one of us have watched at least once in your life, the iconic game show host of Jeopardy. He passed away this year as well. That's the nature of stars. It doesn't matter how bright your star Stars seem to rise and then stars eventually die. But did you know that there is one star that will never, ever die? There is one star that will never fade away. The world is full of stars, but only one will never, ever fall. And that is what this series is about. The one star that will shine forever. The one star that will continue to shine brighter. It's Numbers 24 and verse 17, a messianic prophecy. As God prophesied that one day a star would come, God God's son, the anointed one that would reverse the curse of Adam's sin for all men and all women. A star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. This was a prophecy written centuries BC that one day the promised one, the anointed one, the Christ would come out of this place known as Israel or the nation of Jacob and the scepter would come speaking of his royalty and his deity. And do you understand that this is what makes Jesus unique in all of history that every other star rises and every other star will die, but it's Jesus who's from everlasting to everlasting. He is unique of all the stars you've ever known. Do you understand who he really is? Why we celebrate his birth? He is the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. He is the one that was dead, but he's alive forevermore, and he holds the keys of hell and death. Isaiah 7, 14, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. I said forever. Forever. You see, Jesus is the star that's going to last forever, and that is what this series is about. We're going to do what the wise men did 2,000 years ago. We're going to follow a star, and that star is Jesus. He is the star of this story, and that's what the wise men did. Now, if you uh, are familiar with the Christmas story, if you're familiar with the nativity scene, you've seen all the props, you've seen all the players, and you know sometimes we can kind of pass over it without really examining what is it that God wants to teach us? And do you understand that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels in the Bible, these are eyewitness accounts of the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ. And Matthew is the only one of those four eyewitnesses that tells us about the magi, the wise men. And we're going to follow this star with the wise men over the next few weeks to see what they saw. What was it that made them wise? And why did Matthew think it was so important that we knew their story? Matthew 2 and verse 1. Are you ready for this? Say, Merry Christmas. If you're not ready, say, Bah humbug. Yeah, don't say that. Just sit there. You might be the first person that we ever throw out of church. All right, all right, here, here we go, we're ready now. Some of you guys are not in the Christmas spirit. You're gonna get there. All right, here it is. Now, it says in Matthew 2 and verse one, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, 
In the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Who are these magi? That's the word in the Greek, magi, from which we get the translation wise men. Historically, we know quite a bit about them. They trace their roots to probably at least 600 years B.C., uh, all the ancient kings had magi in their court. Uh, they were known as wise men. They're the ones the kings would turn to for secret knowledge and answers. And they were said to be able to read signs and to read omens. But these wise men are unique. These wise men were different. Uh, they historically were astronomers. Uh, they would study the night skies because the ancient people like today often believe the answers are in the stars. Uh, they were astrologers. Some of them would worship the stars. But these magi were different. They were unique because when they looked at the night sky, they saw a star that shined. They said that shouldn't be there. That is not normal. It must be a sign. It must be a symbol. It must be a sign that the numbers 2415 star has come, that star that will arise out of Jacob, that scepter, speaking of this royalty and his deity that would come out of Israel. And so they come now to Jerusalem looking for this promised king, this promised one, this, this one that God would say is the Christ, the anointed one. And they say, we've seen a star, we've come to worship him. Now, if you study this out on your own, you'll find a lot of debate, a lot of mystery around the star. What is the star? because it wasn't supposed to be there. And these magi knew the night sky. They knew the stars. They studied the stars. That's why they knew this was a sign, a symbol from God. And so you see a lot of debate about what the star is. And you see a lot of people will argue for like a supernova or some type of cosmic event that can ex be explained scientifically or naturally. But I would contend this was not a natural event. This had to be a supernatural event. You see, even as Christians in Western civilization, we have a naturalistic filter on everything we see. So we want to explain everything naturalistically. But do you understand that we have a Bible that we're studying that is a supernatural book full of supernatural things? The universe cannot be explained entirely naturalistically. And I would suggest that what these men saw was anything but natural. And when you study the Bible, what you discover is Old Testament, New Testament, stars are often signs or symbols or metaphors for angels. In all probability, the star the wise men saw was an angel God sent to shine as a sign of Christ's birth. And you can see how stars are symbols of angels throughout Scripture. Job 38, verse 7. Isaiah 14, verse 13. Revelation 1 and verse 20. Uh, Revelation 12 and verse 4. All those verses show you that when God mentions stars, sometimes what he's talking about is actually angels. And we know that this was not any normal star. This was no supernova. This was no cosmic event that can be explained scientifically. Because after talking to King Herod... They find out this baby is supposed to be in Bethlehem. Look at what it says in verse 9. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the child, young child, was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. The implication here is the star disappeared somewhere. They, they no longer saw the star. And so they went to Jerusalem thinking, well, this is the holy city of the Jews. The king ought to be there. And then all of a sudden, the star reappears. Now, how does a supernova do that? Well, let me just answer, it can't. And not only that, but the star all of a sudden begins to move. It says it went before them until it stood over the very place where the child was. See, stars don't do that. Cosmic events don't do that, but angels do that. So I would contend what they saw was an angel, and that was the Bethlehem star that was meant to guide them to the location of this new king, this uh, promised one, the star that would arise out of Jacob. Now, what made these wise men so wise? What is it about these men that Matthew thought you needed to know 2,000 years later? So much to learn from them. I'm convinced sometimes we know the story, we've heard it all before, and we just kind of skip over these parts, and we just kind of scratch the surface, 
and we don't really see what God has for us to learn. I'm convinced this is here for a reason. First of all, the wise men weren't just watching the world, they were watching the word. These wise men were seeing what was happening in the world and they were using the filter of the word and because of that, they were able to connect the dots. When others couldn't, let's face it, they weren't the only ones that saw that star in the night sky. Many would have seen that star, but they didn't connect the dots. They didn't know what it meant. And the reason why is you had wise men who were watching what was going on in the world, and then they were matching it up to the word, and they knew exactly what that meant. That is the star of Numbers 24, 15, this one of deity, this one of royalty. He's finally come, the promised one. And that is what you and I ought to be doing today as we watch current events in the world, and we begin to match it up with the word, we can, like the wise men know, we are living right on the cusp of the king coming again. And this is why they were wise. They were called wise because they weren't just studying the stars. They were studying the scriptures. Now, what do we know about the Magi? The Magi traced the roots at least to 600 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC conquered Jerusalem. And if you know the story from the book of Daniel in your Old Testament, written by the prophet Daniel, Daniel was among the Hebrew children carried off into captivity into Babylon. And he lived most of his life in Babylon. And what we know about Daniel is that he became chief of the Magi or chief of Nebuchadnezzar's wise men. This is in Daniel chapter 5, verse 11, Daniel 4 and verse 9, that both King Nebuchadnezzar, this Babylonian king, as well as his son who became king, the man by the name of Belshazzar, both of them named Daniel chief of the Magi. Now why? Why did he call him chief of the Magi? Well, the story goes like this, Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and it really, really disturbs him. He doesn't know what it means. And so he gets his wise men together, the Magi. And the Magi would have been employed by these ancient kings because they were said to have secret knowledge and they were said to have wisdom about events and they were kind of the answer men and what do I do? And they would consult, you know, the pagan deities or they would consult the stars, you know, astrology. And uh, they were sometimes just plain con men. And apparently Nebuchadnezzar knew uh, that sometimes they just lied to look good. They just made something up. Like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll use the term, is horse hockey okay in church? Okay, the horse hockey factor was sky high, okay? You, you, tra- you tracking with me? So what does he say? He says to his wise men, look, I need you to interpret my dream, but I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. You've got to tell me what it is, and then you interpret it. So they couldn't just make something up, all right? They're on to these guys. But there's one among them who does know what the dream is, Daniel 2 says. God told him Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and he was able to tell Nebuchadnezzar his dream in detail, like only God could do that. And then he interpreted his dream. And because he was able to do that, he promotes him to be the head of the magicians, the head of the magi, the head of the wise men. And we learn this phrase over and over again in Daniel that even the pagan wise men, the ones that worship pagan deities and astrology and look for the answers in all the wrong places, even they knew there's something unique about Daniel. Daniel was said to have the spirit of the living God living in him. And so Daniel becomes very famous of the wise men. And so that even 600 years later, that legacy, that history remains with these magi from the east and what is today known as Iran or Persia or what was then known as Babylon. And they were studying the stars, but they were also studying scriptures because Daniel left the Hebrew scripture behind, the scripture that told of the anointed one, the Jewish Messiah that would one day come. And they connected the dots as they look at the stars and they see it as a sign, having studied the scriptures. Now, how did they know? Well, Daniel wrote a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 where he predicted to the exact day when the Messiah would come. 600 years B.C., 
And these magi are studying the scripture that this famous magi left behind 600 years earlier, and they have a calculator and a calendar, and they realize this must be a sign. The promised one has come. Daniel chapter 9. Look at what it says in Daniel 9, 24. Now, if you've never heard this prophecy before, prepare to be amazed. 61 prophecies in the Old Testament made hundreds of years B.C. about the Christ that God promised would come, the Messiah, the Savior King. Jesus fulfilled all 61. We can prove it historically. We can prove it literally. And none so amazing as this prophecy right here as Daniel, 600 years B.C., prophesies to the day that the Messiah, the Savior King, would enter into Jerusalem, proclaiming himself to be the fulfillment of all of these prophecies. Look at what it says, right? It says this, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, speaking of Christ. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And so what's going on here? Daniel, 600 years B.C., has written a prophecy predicting the exact day the Messiah would enter Jerusalem. That day begins, this prophecy begins with this command to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, we've been studying a few weeks ago. Remember Nehemiah, that study? It was only a few weeks ago. It feels like years ago now, doesn't it? Because like 2020, you know, you've heard of dog years 2020 has been a dog year for us all. Like we have all aged seven years in one year. We've all lived enough life for seven years in, in one year. You, you agree? Yeah, it seems like a long time ago. We're studying Nehemiah. We're coming back to Nehemiah in January, by the way. So one of the things we learned in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter two, what happened? Artaxerxes, the Persian king, makes a decree to go back and restore and build Jerusalem. All right? Now, what's amazing is Daniel promised that would happen 200 years before Artaxerxes would even come to power. Yeah, God is amazing, isn't he? It's like, oh, Pastor Phil, I could, oh, only God could have done that. That's my point. Yeah, only God could do that stuff. And so what is Daniel teaching? And the Magi were studying the scripture as they were studying the stars. He was teaching from that moment, from that day, that Artaxerxes gives the command to Nehemiah to go back and rebuild and restore Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Clear as mud, isn't it? All right, let me help out with this. All right, this word weeks is the Hebrew word heptad. It's a unit of seven. It's kind of like our word in the English, dozen. I can say I have a dozen. Your natural response is a dozen what? I got to say, right? The context, like I might have a dozen donuts. I might have a dozen eggs. I'd rather have a dozen donuts than eggs. How about you? Amen? Amen? But I have to say, the, it doesn't give you the context. It doesn't what? Well, this is similar. The word heptad is a unit of seven, and the context tells you seven what? So what we know from the context, we're not talking about literal weeks here. We're talking about weeks of years. So it's 70 weeks of years or 490 years. The prophet Daniel is prophesying a 490-year prophecy on the Jewish people and the holy city, and what he's saying is that there would be 69 weeks before Messiah would come. Jesus fulfilled the first 69 weeks with his first coming. There's still the 70th week that remains. There's 2,000 years separating the 69th week and the 70th week. That's why you've heard of the seven-year tribulation. That's Daniel's 70th week. And there's still one last week that remains for this prophecy to be fully fulfilled. Now, what he says is that from the going forth of that decree to rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince would be 62 weeks and seven weeks. Now, I'm not great at math, but 62 plus seven equals what? Some of you aren't very good at it either, I can tell. Let me give you the answer, 69. 
So you have 69 weeks, which equals 483 years for Messiah to fulfill this prophecy entering Jerusalem. And Daniel predicts to the very day what day that would be. And the reason we know this is not only is this biblical history, Nehemiah chapter 2 tells us that Artaxerxes was in his 20th year, but the Persians were careful record keepers. It's an archaeological, extra-biblical history. We know the exact day that King Artaxerxes of Persia gave that command and decree to Nehemiah, the first of Nisan, or we'd call it today, March the 14th, 445 B.C. And what Daniel's saying is from that day, count forward 483 years, and that will give you the exact day that Messiah will enter Jerusalem, proclaiming himself to be the Christ, the promised one, that star that would arise out of Jacob. Now listen carefully. The Jews used a lunar year. We use a solar year. Solar year has 365 days. Tribute to Alex Trebek. The answer is... 360 days. Daily double. Come on. What is a lunar year? The Jews used a lunar year, 360 days. So check this out. You can, you can do this on your own. You can read this on your own. Very smart people, one of which would be Sir Robert Anderson, who records this in his book, The Coming Prince, actually does the math and when you count forward from this day, changing it from solar years to lunar years, you count forward exactly 183,770 days to April the 6th, 32 AD, the exact day that the Messiah entered Jerusalem in precision fulfillment of this prophecy written 605 B.C., I think we can trust the Bible. What do you think? Now, if you look this up and do a little study on your own, you'll hear scholars kind of debate. Well, some say it was 444 B.C., some say it was 445 B.C. Here's the reason why. Our modern calendar has changed many times through the centuries. We currently live on a, the Gregorian calendar changed by Pope Gregory in 1582. And so scholars debate, you know, because the calendar's changed so many times, some think it was 444 B.C., others say, well, 445 B.C., you're missing the point. You're missing the point. It doesn't matter. What we know is that Daniel, to the day, with precision, predicted when Messiah would come. Now you know how the Magi were able to understand the star as a sign in the sky because they were studying the sky, they were studying the stars, but they were also studying the scriptures. They had a calculator and a calendar and they said, you know what? It's 483 years. I mean, Messiah must be here. He must be the one. And that is why they set out on a thousand mile journey traveling to Jerusalem because they understood exactly Exactly what had happened because the Messiah had finally come. And I want you to understand that like the wise men, as we study the word, we should be watchful for Christ's return for the very same reasons and exactly what they did as you study the current events of the world and the word becomes the filter for what you see in the word, we can say with absolute certainty that we are living in the season of the second coming and every single time we celebrate Christ's first coming at Christmas, it ought to be a reminder that one day there's going to be a second coming. The second coming of Christ is near. We live in the season of the second coming of Christ. We ought to be watchful. We ought to be ready. Here's what's amazing. Jesus was a Jew. You know what it says in John chapter 1? He came unto his own, but his own received him not. Even the Jewish people who had received the Jewish prophecies, they were not watching and they were not ready. Yet Gentile pagan men living a thousand miles away, they were watching and they were ready. And sometimes I convince we, the church, the people of God, we ought to be watching. We ought to be ready. But some of us ain't paying attention. And only as you're watching the world and you're studying it through the lens of the word can you be ready, can you be wise. And it ought to give us comfort. I don't know about you, but this is a year unlike any other year where my heart has been troubled. 
You know what Jesus said on the night before his death? He said, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If not, so I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, if you know Jesus and you've been following Jesus, that ought to give you a sense of joy. Now, if you don't know Jesus, you can't find the joy because you're not ready. You haven't been watching. But today, all that can begin to change. Here's what the apostle Peter would say, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. Listen, I have just confirmed to you the prophetic word. You hear people say all the time, well, you know, you can't trust the Bible, it's reliability, it's historicity. I mean, you can't trust, it's just the word of men, it's just full of myths. No, I've got a book that predicted to the day Christ would first come. Do you think I can trust him for what it says about the second coming? I like my odds. See, this is what Peter is saying. We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in the dark place. Listen, we live in a time of darkness. Guys, I'm telling you, I have lived long enough. I'm, I'm starting to sound like my grandpa. I'm sorry. And I'm not even a grandpa yet. I'm just starting to sound like one. I have lived long enough to say the world is growing darker. And I was raised in the 80s, and it was not exactly a biblical bastion of holy light then either. (laughs) I'm just saying, it's getting darker. It's It's getting nastier. It's getting uglier. But what Peter is saying is we have a light. We have a light as wise men and wise women. We have the light of God in the darkness of our day that we do well to heed, to pay attention to, to follow until when? Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Peter's promising there is a new day about to dawn. There's a new day coming. And Jesus, who it says in Micah 5, 2, is the son of righteousness that will rise with healing in his wings. In the same way the sun, S-U-N, comes up on the eastern horizon, and every single morning that day star rises and it chases away the blackness of the night. There is coming a day that the sun, S-O-N, is going to rise with healing in his rays, with healing in his wings, and the light of God is going to chase away forever the darkness of our day. Then it's going to be eternal day. A new day is going to dawn. And you hold on to that until the morning star rises in your heart. Jesus being that morning star. The morning star is unlike any other star. It is the last star you see before the dawn begins to come. And what Peter's saying is Jesus is going to come as the morning star. And this is what makes him unique of all the other stars. It will be an eternal day. There will never, ever again be night. There will be never again no darkness, only light. You see, Jesus is unique of all the other stars you've ever known. Jesus will shine brighter. He will shine forever. Do you understand who Jesus is? We talk about it at Christmas. Listen, Jesus is the sinless son of God who came like the sons of men so the sons of men could be forgiven of their sin so that we could become like him. Philippians chapter two, it says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and coming in the fashion as a bondservant and in the likeness of men, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that is named, that in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is the one. He's the promised one. Jesus is the one that you've been looking for. Which star are you following? Because the world is full of stars. Be careful you follow the right one. 
Jesus is the one that bore our sin. He came for one reason, not more religion, but rather redemption so that we could be born again, a new creation, so that he could reverse the curse of Adam's sin upon all men and all women. Romans 5 and verse 12, as by one man's sin, that's Adam, death entered the world. So death passed on all men, for all have sinned. We're all under the penalty of sin. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Christ our Lord, Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, but by his stripes we are healed. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, Jesus was not simply a baby who was lying in a manger. He was the Messiah that was destined for the cross. And that is why we cannot talk about the resurrection if there was not first a crucifixion. And there would be no crucifixion if there was not first the incarnation. At Christmas, what do we celebrate? Something theologians call the incarnation, that God became a man so that he could become our sacrificial lamb. The only question that remains is have you placed your faith in him? Have you put your trust in him to forgive your sin? He's the only one that can, and that's what makes him a star unlike any other star. The one that rose again that will live forever and establish a kingdom that will be without end. Only by following the star of Jesus can your life shine brighter and shine forever. Listen carefully. Every single one of us have a tendency to make ourselves the star of our story. Because we're all part of fallen humanity, we all wanna be the star of our story. Especially increasingly in this selfie society. And I'm trying to tell you that only when you give up the right to be the star of your story and you make Jesus the star of your story will your life shine brighter and, yes, last forever. It says in Proverbs 4.18, but the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Aren't you glad there's a perfect day on the way? Currently, we don't live in a perfect day. We live in an age that is broken because of sin, cursed because of sin. There is suffering because of sin. All is not perfect in God's universe because of sin. But there's coming a day that the light is going to shine forever. The light of God will shine bright. No more darkness, no more night. It's going to be a perfect day. But until that day, our light, the life, can shine brighter as the world gets darker. Now contrast that with the very next verse. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Everywhere you look, there are people stumbling in the dark, searching for the light. John chapter one says, light has come into the world, but men and women love darkness rather than light until you turn to the light and quit turning away from the light, your life can never shine brighter and you will not live forever. The wages of sin is death. His story is absolutely tragic. If you're my age, you probably don't know who this is, but I promise your kids do. He was known as Juice World. At 21 years of age, he was a rising star But a year ago this week, he died of an overdose. He wrote a song called Legends. It's tragic. What he says in this song, the lyrics go something like this. I don't want to be a legend because I hear they all die young. Ironically, he recorded a song before he died. It was released after he died. The name of that song is Can't Die. And the tragedy of his story is in the lyrics. One of the lyrics in this song goes like this, I can't die because I've never been alive. His friends kept telling him, you're going to OD, you're going to OD, you're going to OD. He wrote this song in response. Tell me, they tell me I'm going to OD in no time. I told them I'll do it on my time, 
not your time. And a year ago this Tuesday, that's exactly what he did. 21 years of age. His star rose quickly, shined brightly, and died. Now compare that story to Philippians 2, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We are living at a time that is crooked and perverse, this generation, but that does not have to be our story. When we make Jesus the star of our story, he said, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. You know the story of Juice World, but I bet you don't know the story of this man, Chadwick Boseman. Oh, you know he's the star of Black Panther. You know he's the star of the movie, 43, where he portrayed Jackie Robinson. But did you know that he was an outspoken Christian, a follower of Jesus? And even as his star rose in Hollywood, he never succumbed to the depravity of the industry, continued in some capacity till the day he died to live for Jesus, to testify of Jesus. lived for four years fighting cancer. He would go to cancer wards and hospitals just to encourage people fighting cancer. They had no idea he was fighting cancer too. He said these words before he died. When I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I would not have a single bit of talent left and could say I used everything you gave me. That's what God wants to do with us all, that we give him all we are for all that he is. We make the great exchange, his life for our life, because he first made the great exchange, his life for our life. Have you made the great exchange? Have you made Jesus the star of your story? Are you still trying to follow your own star? I love the story of this young lady being baptized today, redeemed out of a life of sex trafficking. Did you hear a story? I felt like invisible chains were broken. Invisible chains fell away. We all wear a pair of invisible chains, every one of us. You're born with those chains under sin's penalty. You will for all your life wear a set of chains. You'll either wear the chains of sin or you'll wear the chains of him. See, years ago, I chained myself to him, so I'm no longer chained to sin. And that is the remarkable story of God's redemption. That can be your story today. Your life will only shine eternally when you made Jesus the star of your story. If you've never done that, now's the time. Would you bow with me right now? You online, wherever you're watching, would you bow with us right now? God, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice that God, you would show us our true condition spiritually, our destiny eternally, that you would not allow us to walk in darkness or deception or the distortion of our day. Just wanna ask you a question, I just want you to sit and contemplate for a moment. Do you know for sure your destiny eternally? If you died today, do you know where you would be? Because if you're not certain, you can be. For this cause, Christ came. If you took one last breath in time and woke up in eternity, do you know what you would see? You're going to someday. Well, I wanna pray for you right now if you'd let me. Over in Blue Springs, right here in Lee Summit, even those online, I can't see you, but most of all, God sees you right now. And if you're not certain, I wanna pray for you. Would you just lift up your hand very quickly, very quietly for just a moment, just hold it in the air. Yes, God bless you both, I see you. God sees you, yes sir. Just hold your hand up right now, would you? I want to pray for you. Jesus, you see these hands in the air. Lord, they represent honest hearts. 
And I pray your hand of grace would reach down from heaven and touch these hands in the air with the knowledge of the living God known through the Son of God. And that today would be the day of salvation for many. I'm gonna pray a prayer right now. You can pray this with me right where you sit, online or right here on site, doesn't matter. Today can be the day that you redefine not just your life, but the one beyond. I want you to pray this with me right now. Pray this under your breath. God will hear your prayer. Jesus, I know that I've sinned, but I cannot get to heaven without you. But I believe you are that star, that you are the only star that will live forever. And today I make you the star of my story. I surrender my life for your life. I believe you died for my sin, that you rose again. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Change me from within. And help me to follow you all the days of my life until one day soon I see you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you give him the glory with me, praising?